military veterans. I raised my right hand and I took an oath to the Constitution to hopefully do something meaningful with my life. You know, 19 years old, unsure what I wanted to do. So I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. My job in the U.S. Air Force was working in bioenvironmental engineering. So what bioenvironmental engineering is in the Air Force is equivalent to that of the OSHA and the EPA, if you're familiar with that. So we were an embedded liaison to make sure that we were tracking all of the aspects and impacts of the military, meaning what is the military doing and how is it impacting the environment because we were accountable for that. Being government, we did not get any special treatment. We just couldn't be fined being another federal agency. EPA can't, but not OSHA. So from the health side, it was knowing what you do in the Air Force. What does your job entail that is hazardous to your health? And I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say that you were an aircraft painter, you were a mechanic. My job would go out to make sure I knew everything that you did, what you were exposed to, and how to mitigate and engineer out those hazards. Because we needed to, one, it, it's your legal right to be working in a safe and healthful work environment. So throughout nine years, I worked as an industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. One of, actually, there's two bases I was at that are called air logistics centers. What does that mean? It's not like a fighter wing, you know, it's not really fun and amazing. What they did is they took aircraft that around every 10 to 15 years, they were required to be dismantled down to the last screw. So that meant every single industrial process you can think about, checking the metal integrity, making sure everything's good to go, or sometimes overhauling equipment. Part of my job in tracking the health hazards was to look at any time someone wanted to buy a chemical, any type of chemical. It was ordered through a system, and in that system, I had to go in there and say, you know, the country we're in, we're not allowed to use this. We need to substitute it out with something a little less hazardous, while also maintaining the integrity for a technical order, meaning for that process, it says you must use, you know, xylene or toluene to do this process. Well, I have to kind of fast forward. I want to say around 2006, I started kind of opening my eyes to how the military wasn't really what I thought it was. And people approached me knowing what I did for a living and said, have you ever heard of chemtrails? Well, I hadn't. And that sparked my interest. So I went online and I looked at chemtrails. I saw a lot of, you know, debunking, a lot of sites that were just kind of calling it a conspiracy theory. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. Preventive health, making sure that people are not getting sick, especially in the workplace and by things that we're doing that can affect, you know, human health and the environment. To summarize it, in an attempt to debunk this conspiracy theory as I thought it was, I didn't debunk it. It literally changed my life. Um, like I said, this is hard for me because it's not easy standing here and telling my story. One day I was going through that computer system, which if you want to look it up, it's called an Air Force Form 3952. It is the approval of ha hazardous materials. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium, in the forms of oxides and sulfates. And of course I knew that there's industrial processes you may not have heard of, but it's bead blasting, pneumatic sanding, shot peening. There is certain medias that's similar to that that is used. However, I had already accounted for that. I would sit and look at this computer system and say, this shop wants to order this paint. I'm going to tie it to a task. We had to know what was being used, why it was being used, tracking it cradle to grave on how we were going to dispose of it to be compliant with OSHA and the EPA. One of the legal requirements in approving these is looking at what used to be called the material safety data sheet. On that sheet, it's going to list the manufacturer. It's going to list some maybe acquired personal protective equipment that needs to be used or some ways to mitigate the exposures. These electronic MSDSs, did not have a manufacturer name. They were very vague. They almost looked to me like somebody had made it and scanned it into the system. So I asked the question, what is this being used for? I never got an answer, so I didn't approve it. And it sat there. And then the heat came down. Why aren't you, are you behind on your 3952s? Only a select few of us did that. So I started asking questions. And at that point, my demonization began. 
you know, I, I made my rank. I was decorated. I was a non-commissioned officer of the quarter. I won lots of awards. I had no reason for anyone to attempt to demonize me. So then I get moved over to the other Air Logistics Center. There's only two in the Air Force, which is in Warner Robins, Georgia. This kind of carried with me. And I thought, you know what? Should I revisit this? Is it worth it? Did I hit something? Maybe it's need to know. I started finding the same things at Robbins Air Force Base. I was now doing some more investigation work. Part of what I did was to use a high volume air sampler to air sample um, up to, I'd say, a football field in about 10 minutes. I also conducted soil sampling because I thought, you know, if, if this is real and they are spraying this, it's going to get to the ground. So I conducted air sampling, I conducted soil sampling, and I was getting high levels of these contaminants. When I started asking the question again under a new commander, I never in my life thought I would have somebody look me in the face and tell me, I am questioning you. Is there something wrong with you? You've been looking really depressed lately. You know I can put you under a mental evaluation for up to 120 days. Who would take care of your daughter? Because I was divorced at the time. As soon as I heard that, I knew. It validated everything I ever thought. And I thought, I have spent nine years of my life trying to protect human health, and here we are, violating law after law after law. Just sitting here, instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. And I've never got up so much courage from that fear of being thrown in a cage, because when you're in the military, folks, you're a number. You are a number, and every aspect of your life is controlled. I was so lucky that my enlistment was coming up and I was supposed to re-enlist. I ran and did not look back. And I have been blowing the whistle and shouting ever since. And I left October 27, 2010. Thank you. It didn't just end there, though. You gotta remember, there's a whole career field of people that work in bioenvironmental engineering. A lot of those people were told, do not talk to me. Do not talk to her, do not email her. They were given no contact orders. Because my biggest thing was, if I'm just so you know, dishonest, don't you think somebody would come out and say, you know, she was never in the military or something negative to discredit me. They've ignored me, but they've tried to silence me. Engineering is the number one issue that we are facing because you can have guns and money and you can have everything. If you don't have food and water and you are dying of respiratory or neurological illnesses, what does it matter? So you've heard about vaccines and you'll hear you know, about smart meters and you'll hear about other issues.